It's undeniable. If you've ever been into some kind of audio-related hobby, you'll have heard of this thing called a compressor. Compressors are a quintessential part of audio processing work. But why? Engineers swear by them. It's kind of freaky. I mean, they have millions of them. Look at this collection. Alright, this guy definitely has a problem. A compressor is everyone's prime example for a component that processes dynamics. That is, a compressor affects the level of the signal going into it. There are a few types of other dynamics processors, namely limiters, gates, and expanders. Although, we won't be talking much about gates and expanders in this video. All dynamics processors are surprisingly simple in operation, but I remember being confused by them for a very long time. A lot of resources do a relatively poor job at explaining how they work, so I'm going to try to do a slightly less good job of explaining them to you now. Alright, let's say you have a signal that's way too loud. What are you gonna do? Uh, uh, well, obviously you're going to want to turn it down somehow. You can do this by moving the volume manually, but if you have a sound with rapidly moving dynamics, like a drum loop or a vocal, It'd be a lot of work to manually adjust the volume every time the vocalist decides to sing a syllable a little louder than the other one. Compressors are tools that you can use to automatically adjust this volume. So imagine it as a virtual assistant, someone having their hand on the volume slider ready at all times. There are a few functions on a compressor, but they're always visualized slightly differently, which is why it's so important to know precisely what's going on under the hood. Let's start with the threshold. The threshold is basically the volume border at which the compressor starts considering the incoming signal to be too loud. The compressor will not activate if the volume level of the incoming signal stays below the threshold. So in order to engage it, we need to make sure the threshold is low enough for the signal to pass into it. There we go. Next, we're discussing the ratio. The ratio describes the way volume is rescaled above the threshold. I think this is visualized surprisingly well by one of Ableton Live's stock compressors. You can see the level of the signal coming in from the left as the blue line. This blue volume meter is scaled alongside volume labels on the horizontal axis, which have grey lines above them to make it visually easier to follow along. Now watch what happens to the vertical grey lines above my threshold as I increase the ratio. The skill changes! So. Let's say we have a ratio of 2 to 1. This means that now, it's going to be twice as difficult for the signal to increase in volume after the threshold, visualized here. So, worded differently, for every 2 decibels of gain above the threshold, the volume of the signal will now rise by only 1 decibel. Compressors lower the volume of the incoming signal above the threshold according to the ratio. Compressors usually come with two other parameters that relate to how it acts in time, attack and release. So let's grab a signal with a really loud transient. A transient is the initial burst of sound that happens when something starts playing. So imagine when you hit a cymbal or a drum, the initial peak of the signal is called a transient. Obviously, a transient is going to be the first thing to pass the threshold of your compressor, causing it to engage. The attack value determines the amount of time the compressor waits to engage after the signal has moved into the threshold. So basically, a higher attack value will cause your virtual volume assistant to have a shit reaction time. It's not necessarily a bad thing, actually. Letting the transients through will cause the signal to sound punchier than usual, which is a common characteristic associated with compression. Shorter attack times will cause the transient material to sound more suppressed. The release parameter should be pretty self-explanatory now. The release is basically just the time it takes for the compressor to disengage after the input signal lowers back down in volume. Longer release times will cause a kind of swelling sound as the compressor releases after the transient and ducks the signals after it. Adjusting the release is especially useful if you're trying to shape and adjust the volume of things that are happening in between the transients. Having short release times is especially good on vocals, because it pushes forward the second halves of words, which is a good way to get it to be a bit more in your face. Sometimes you'll see these buttons on the compressor, and they change how the compressor reads volume from the incoming signal. So basically, 
It's a way to change the skills of all of your settings. I recommend to try which ones you like best for each scenario. Generally, Peak is really accurate and super fast, and RMS is a little smoother. What you're looking at now is a wave shaper. A wave shaper is a very simple digital effect that also modifies amplitude. In digital audio, waveforms are stored and processed in a way that's actually not too dissimilar to digital images. Just like with images, audio data has a horizontal resolution and a vertical resolution that are used to store information. Audio pixels are called samples, so if you zoom really far into a waveform, you can actually see them. It's these little dots, and each of them represents a sample in the audio file. So let's paraphrase a little bit. The horizontal position of these samples obviously determines their place in time, and their vertical position determines their amplitude. These factors are combined to store and process audio inside of your computer. There's a lot more I can say about how digital audio is stored, so this is really gross oversimplification, but please bear with me. Why can it never be easy? Alright, so let's take a look at the wave shaper again. It's a graph with two axes. The horizontal axis represents the amplitude of incoming samples, while the vertical axis represents the new amplitude of the samples leaving the wave shaper. This white line in the middle represents the relationship between these two. Right now, nothing is happening as the signal remains untouched. The line is straight. All samples enter and leave the wave shaper with their original amplitude. So let's modify this line a little bit to make the top flat. Now, all the computer needs to do is watch out for samples in the top area and displace them into a new position, changing the volume or shape of the signal. What we just created is the clip distortion from the last video, but since we have a wave shaper, we have a bit more power over what's happening. For example, we can round it out like this to make the clip a bit more smooth. This kind of thing is called soft clipping. It's a variant that's a bit less square-like than standard digital clipping. Obviously, you can do much more with a wave shaper, including this Now, you might be wondering, we have two different effects that both modify the volume of the incoming signal, so what's the difference? The thing that's kind of deceiving is that oftentimes a compressor is visualized very similarly to a wave shaper, but they're not used for the same application whatsoever. While wave shaper is practically instantaneous, the compressor has an attack and a release. So by definition, a compressor is more transparent and more natural sounding, while a wave shaper is actually used for distortion more than anything. If you find a compressor that has an attack and release value that go all the way down to 0 milliseconds, as well as an infinite to 1 ratio, you essentially create a clipper. Most compressors also come with an E function. This is something that smooths out the border between the threshold and the linear line, just like how rounder clipping causes the distortion in the wave shaper to sound smoother and less digitally aggressive. By that logic, yes, if you use knee on the zero attack and release compressor, it would sound exactly like a soft clipper. Now, most compressors don't go all the way down to zero ms, and this is for good reason, because doing that causes a lot of distortion. This is why compressors will, even on the lowest attack setting, let a small blip of transient fruit. In my opinion, one of the most common misconceptions I see flying around is that a compressor is a good tool to tame very loud sudden transients. This is because, as long as there's an attack, the compressor will always exemplify the transient a little bit, instead of properly taking care of it. Instead, I personally use compressors to bring quieter material in the signal to the front, like I said earlier. One of the many ways to do this is to compress a signal really hard and then mix it in parallel. This is called parallel or New York style compression, and you'll see lots of videos about it on YouTube. One thing you might be asking me now is, Midas, how do we tame transients then? Well, obviously, if you're making EDM, you can just soft clip them. In digital compressors, there's this feature called Look Ahead, in which the compressor stores a small buffer of audio, allowing the attack to engage before the transient has occurred. Dan Warhol has a really great video about this on his YouTube channel, so if you're interested, I would highly recommend checking that out if you want to learn more about this. But if we're thinking about being transparent, let's maybe take a look at limiters instead. As far as I'm aware, a limiter is basically just a compressor and a soft clipper in series. First, the signal is caught by a relatively high release compressor to catch volume changes, after which the transients are soft clipped as transparently as possible. 
In FabFilter Pro L2, the different modes choose between different presets for the compressor stage in the limiter. Some limiters also have adaptive release algorithms, where the release time of the compression stage is modified by some algorithm based on the character of the signal going into it. Previously I mentioned Look Ahead. Most if not all limiters have some kind of Look Ahead feature built into their compressors. This actually includes live small little stock limiter. In Ableton, you can check how much time a plugin buffers for by hovering over it in the effects chain. FabFilter Pro L2 stores about 15 milliseconds of audio data on transparent mode, which is my favorite because it has the least colorful compression setting. And finally, there's also true peak limiting, which is an important topic I should cover in this video. When audio samples are played back on your system, the little dots are connected by a digital to analog converter. Sometimes, what will happen with dots close to the top or very high frequency content is that the actual analog signal will shoot above zero decibels and distort anyway. This is most noticeable on cars and like old speaker systems. In order to prevent this, you can enable oversampling on your soft clipping devices and limiters, or you can hit the True Peak Limiting button, as seen here in FabFilter Pro L. What I just explained was how most digital or clean compressors and limiters work. Obviously, there is a bunch of plugins that try to emulate vintage hardware. You've probably heard of the ones made by Waves, or a few other companies also exist. But basically, these emulation plugins tend to digitally emulate artifacts created by the analog hardware. Well, you can't really call them artifacts, but they're like bioprocesses, right? So, these plugins tend to do other stuff, other than just do clean limiting or clean compression. Um, the way they emulate the vintage hardware is by also doing some kind of saturation or like some kind of distortion or some other things that are usually not directly associated with clean compression in order to mimic the sound of the original hardware. 